Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening or good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. I am Mariette Westermann, the Vice Chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi. Welcome to the seventh Vice Chancellor's Roundtable of this academic year. In this series of conversations, we meet leaders in the UAE in many sectors of society and the economy, public and private, local and international and regional. We learn in our conversations with them about the fundamentals of various industries and civic endeavors. And we learn about change, adaptation, resilience, and success, and sometimes failure, and what we can learn from it. We gain perspective on different ways of being a leader and on crafting lives of purpose and contribution. We hear how leaders reflect on their education, on their mentors, and what it has meant and what these people have meant to their trajectories. Thus far this year, or this academic year, we have spoken with leaders in real estate and urban development, banking and finance, media, film and communications, diplomacy and international relations, and earlier this month, strategic philanthropy and entrepreneurship. Today, we have a very special guest. My guest is Her Excellency Mira al -Suedi who is the head of value creation at Mubadala Investment Company. She is also an appointed member of the Federal National Council, the parliamentary body of the UAE. At Mubadala, she is responsible for identifying synergies and driving growth opportunities within portfolio companies. She's helping them to leverage Mubadala's scale and reach, including overseeing the development of Hub 71 on Maria Island. Uh, Her Excellency holds a master's degree in public affairs from Sciences Po and a Bachelor of Arts degree in accounting from the American University in Dubai, where she graduated magna cum laude. It is a great honor to have such an accomplished and also I have to say very busy leader of business and civic affairs in the UAE and beyond with us. Welcome, uh, Your Excellency. Um, we will have a conversation for some 45 minutes or so. I think most of you know the format. And we will then turn to questions from our audience. Please put them in the Q&A function as you always do. And you may do so at any time during this session and we'll try to get to all of your interests uh, and comments. So um, welcome again. We're really thrilled to have you with us uh, at this table. I think I muted myself accidentally. We're still not fully used to this, are we? I hope I didn't mute myself the whole way and people heard this introduction, uh, but welcome. Welcome uh, again. We're really happy to have you with us for this conversation. And so we're gonna talk about a range of your interests and accomplishments, but I think we also like to give a bit of a window into your personal trajectory. So often, when our students see an influential leader like yourself, it's often hard for them to imagine how, how these leaders get started, what lifts them on their, on their way. Could you tell us a little about how you began your career journey? Sure, definitely. Uh, first of all, Mariette, I just wanted to thank you personally and thank the team at NYU for giving me this opportunity to interact with your students. Uh, NYUAD has an excellent reputation. And I know that the, the underlying factor of this reputation are its students. So I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to interact with them today. Um, when we talk about career journeys and how you begin, um, I think it's important to note that each one of us, you know, even from a very young age, we kind of know what we like to do and what we don't like to do, right? So you have kids even as young as probably eight years old, you know immediately who likes to speak and who likes to be on stage and uh, you know act and sing and dance. And you know who are the kids who are better at maths, the kids that are better at sports and so on. So you know immediately what you like to do. And I think uh, for myself, from a very young age, I like to speak a lot. I like to negotiate a lot. Um, so um, I do believe that my career journey took off even at a younger age. Um, I did uh, join different programs, uh, even within high school, such as Model United Nations, and I did my international baccalaureate diploma. So that really gave me the right foundation and tools in my toolbox, if you will, 
to help me uh, understand what I want to do. And ever since I was young, I really knew that I wanted to be in public service. Um, however, I did not start in public service because I did work for Mubadala, which is a sovereign, uh, which is a sovereign owned company. But I, I acted, you know, in my in my career within structured finance and capital markets for a good 10 years and then focused on value creation within a financial investment platform. So that's something I, I'm very good at and I can do well. So I also do that. But deep inside, I also want to serve my country. So that's why I have this dual mandate of serving the public, but as well doing uh, doing what I do well. Um, and I think it's just important to, to know that from a young age, and that helps you to shape and drive your career forward. Yeah, you clearly had had that sense that you could do these things. It's lovely to hear you say that you liked to negotiate. Many people find negotiation very hard. So that you recognize that in yourself early on is, is actually uh, significant. So if you reflect back a little on your university experiences, I can imagine you in that beautiful campus Abu Dhabi or in the American University of Dubai in that very special Jeffersonian campus. Um, and then uh, beyond for your graduate work, it, it, what, what has university education meant to you? Education in general, I wouldn't say just university education, but education in general, in general I think taught me a couple of things. The first one is the importance of your network. Never underestimate the power of the network you create while you're studying, be it uh, you know, professors, teachers, um, other students. Uh, sometimes you have visiting students, even your librarian. Never underestimate the power of your network. You can leverage those relationships and you can gain value and experience and learn something new from everyone. Uh, you know, don't don't ever look at someone, you know, like someone that has a smaller role or, uh, you know, someone has a more prominent role, you know, look at everyone equally and you will find that you learn something from everyone. The, the second thing is, um, with, I would say that this is early, later on, so within university and, and, and within my master's program, discipline and responsibility. You have to be disciplined and go to your classes do your work, uh, do your exams, and you have to be responsible. So that teaches you accountability at a very young age. And I think that is what helps shape and uh, you know, drive your career forward. Uh, and I would say key takeaways I took from my, uh, from my learning experiences. These are wonderful comments. And the students are going to think that, uh, maybe so the staff were here too, that you and I scripted this, but we did not. You know, I, I love what you said about learning from everyone, mentioning the librarian and others. My vision of Envoy Abu Dhabi is that everyone's an educator. Everyone's a learner and an educator because you can learn from everyone and we're a learning community. So that's really beautiful how you described it and hard work. I'll give you a small story. Please. Uh, we had the security guard uh, at uh, the American University of Dubai. And then at the American University of Dubai, you had to park outside, right? So a lot of people would try to like, you know, speak to the security guard and bother him to try to get their cars in. But he was so disciplined and he would never say no, no matter who you were, no matter what, he would follow protocols. And no matter how much the students would bother him, he would still smile and say good morning or good afternoon or good evening. And I love that. And it made me, uh, you know, instill this discipline, like I don't need to be your friend. I don't need to have a conversation with you. But I just need to say salam alaikum. Uh, and that for me is, is something that's key. And I think um, I learned that even from the, you know, from, diff from different people, but especially this, uh, the security guard taught me that no matter what, just say hello. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Just say hello, smile, and continue with your day. You don't have to be best friends. You don't have to do anything. Just say hello. It's a great story. Friendly goes a long way and human dignity. I think you said something important about human dignity. Now, here's a hard topic. The majority of the world's venture capitalists are men. I think it would be not just a majority, but a very significant and large majority. Uh, what has it been like for you as a woman leading in this industry? So within the venture space, I think uh, I'm in a quite unique position being Mubadala, right? Mubadala, we are known globally. So yes, we are a company that is owned 100% by the government of Abu Dhabi. 
but we do have over $250 billion of assets under management, over 100,000 employees, and work in over 50 jurisdictions. So we do have quite a global uh, reach. Um, within, so that puts us in a very unique position being a Mubadil employee, right? Wherever we go, we get their respect and, and uh, uh, appreciation from, from different parties because we are Mubadala. But being a woman, what I, what I noticed is that uh, we are actually seeing more and more women within the venture space. Uh, and when you look at it from a financial returns perspective, diverse management teams are actually doing much better. So we, we emphasize, and one, one thing that we, we always focus on is the management team. For mm -hmm. me, when we look at the company, looking at the management team is crucial. We will know how sustainable and how good the business will be uh, based on its team. And diversity within the team is very important. We realize like when we do business as Mubadala, we don't invest in one sector, we invest in diverse sectors. We have diverse uh, you know, backgrounds, diverse age groups, uh, you know, all genders working in Mubadala. So I think it doesn't only depend on women, but also uh, wider diversity is, is crucial. Yes, I think that's become an increasing realization, right? Diversity of inputs together, you know more and you don't get that sort of hive mentality where everybody thinks the same thing. Uh, that's it's a very good point. Um, what advice would you give to our students who are preparing for careers um, where they could expect indeed some significant imbalances in gender or other aspects of one's identity? This is true across the world. Interestingly, here in education, in my environment, we've seen this incredible shift over the last 30 years from mostly male students going to college and university to majorities of students almost anywhere in the world now being women. But in many work sectors, the situation is still quite different. Would you have, what kind of advice do you have for students going into uh, sectors like yours, not necessarily only venture capital, but male Mariette, dominant? Sure. Mariette, I'm sure you have been around Abu Dhabi and you've seen our offices. Do you see more men or more women? In Abu Dhabi and the UAE? In, in the UAE, women are really entering the workforce, but if I'm honest, in the C-suite, it's still different. Agreed, 100%. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure that you will know us in the UAE, we, we do have a, a unique uh, you know, mindset. Uh, and we are actually, even if you look at a government entity, 60% of government employees are women. So we do, we do see more women in the UAE, and that is thanks to our leadership. Our leadership have the right mindset and approach uh, where they ensured that women have been uh, you know, introduced in all different sectors. So just within the Mubadala exa uh, example and Mubadala sto story, we have a company called Strata. Strata produces, manu it manufactures aerostructure composites that go into the tails and wings of aircrafts. Mm -hmm. So, and it's here in, in Al Ain actually. Uh, uh, so you have parts of uh, Airbus and Boeing airplanes that are built here in the UAE, manufactured in our facility in Al Ain, and guess what? By women. So there is no um, you know, sector that you cannot enter. There is no field that you cannot do. If you want to pursue something, you can. Sometimes it might take you a little bit longer. You might need to you know, work a little bit harder, but at the end, if it makes you happy and if it's what, it's what, it's what you want to do, then why not? I don't see any, any harm in doing it. There is no, before we used to look at you know, some sectors as soft sectors and, and then other sectors as mid sectors, but that's not the case anymore. And, and we've shown it most recently with you know, the UAE's uh, mission to Mars. The head Incredible. of, yeah, uh, she was, uh, she's a young uh, female minister. So I really do believe that uh, you know, the world is your oyster. Whatever you want to do, you just have to go out and pursue it. Well, I think what you say is very true about the development of the UAE. As I followed it over the last 15 years, it's been a remarkable agenda item. And this opening of pathways has been remarkable. Uh, going back to the start of the country with Josiah deciding that all girls should go to school just as much as the boys. And that's where it starts, of course. I think you've said something very encouraging about 
the pipeline when you think about it because although i do believe that the executive suites still are a little there's a little um, certainly some imbalance and under representation there that's changing too and as you see all these employees coming in working their way up and merits being rewarded you you do you can well imagine um that that picture really changing as it already has in in many areas of Mubala, for example that's no yes we're, we're a young nation we're a young country what UAE has done in the past 50 years, other countries have done in 200 years, right? So considering just how young we are and how young our population is, right? The majority of our population is under 40. So just yeah. taking those two considerations, uh, you know, uh, and, and looking at it, uh, we will be graduating more leaders and leaders from both genders, uh, you know, very soon. And we have seen this. We have seen the change in our, in our ministerial cabinet. We have so, so much representation, even within parliament, within all the different areas. So you do see that change, but we have to, you know, uh, pace ourselves a little bit and think about it that, yes, we are a young nation and we are a um, young nation by age in terms of the country, but also young in terms of population. So you will see more and more um, female leaders on, uh, you know, board seats and so on in, in the future. And your students at NYU have, you know, have uh, so much opportunity waiting for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true. And many countries, I would say, haven't achieved as much in 200 years. Actually, if you think about the scale of development here for a relatively small population, actually. Let's talk a little bit more about Mubarla. Uh, for those who have joined a little bit later, uh, my guest is Her Excellency Mira al uh, of Mubarla Value Creation and also a member of the Federal National Council. And we're now going to talk a little bit more about Mubarla. And if you have questions, you may put them in the Q&A uh, box anytime and we'll try to get to them. So many of our students are familiar, of course, with the work of Mubarla. It has such a large footprint in the UAE and beyond, but not everyone knows the organization well. Would you mind describing Mubarla and some of its uh, verticals and so forth for us? Sure. Um, I'll try to give you like, um a simple, you know, a simple uh, uh, depiction of how of what Mubadala is. Mubadala was created in 2004 uh, by a very small team. And the main purpose of this team was, uh, was this. Um, they were given an amount of money and they were asked to use it to diversify the economy away from oil dependency. And most of that team uh, actually were were involved in the oil and gas sector so they 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 only their bread and butter was oil and gas so mm -hmm. they thought about okay what are we going to do with this money to diversify away from oil but we're oil and gas guys so they started to think what is one challenge that we're facing in the uae the gas that we produce in the uae is actually re-injected to extract oil so we do have a little bit of you know less gas than 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 what we actually need um, Qatar, on the other hand, uh, has a lot of gas. They have an abundance of gas. So their project was to build a subsea pipeline to, co to connect a gas field in Qatar to the UAE so that we can get gas to use on our grid. Um, and see, it was just a very innovative idea, taking their background, but diversifying away. So they're not depending on the UAE's oil now, but they're diversifying away to bring in gas for our electricity grid. And because they were successful, and you know, it's a crazy idea, you know, building a subsea gas pipeline, um, but it worked. It worked, and now it on, doesn't only connect in Tawila and Abu Dhabi, but it's all, it also connects to the Northern Emirates. Um, they, they were given the trust to start building out more and more, but they were told to, be, to diversify. And that's always my key message, diversify. And they mm -hmm. began looking at sectors, and they used the same mentality, the same thinking of, what do we need? What's missing? One of the key sectors they built up, which was missing for us, is healthcare. The UAE government was spending over $2 billion annually on sending people to get treatment abroad. Uh, because you're paying not only for the treatment, but you're paying for their housing, for their food, for their medical escorts, and so on. So it's quite expensive. And what are Emiratis more, most prone to? Diabetes and knee injuries. So we started as Mubadala to invest in healthcare, focused uh, mainly on diabetes and knees, 
And one of our most prominent projects, as you know, is uh, the Imperial College of London Diabetes Center, which started up with one uh, facility uh, in Abu Dhabi and it now has three facilities, which is amazing. Um, same thing goes to a lot of different sectors, renewable energy, uh, aluminum and uh, other metals, um, uh, aerospace. So we started looking at the sectors where we need to build to develop and diversify away from oil dependency. So that, yes, these are capital intensive, very uh, large scale projects that cost a lot today, but and will not make revenue today. But after 10, 15, 20 years, they will start contributing to the GDP. And that is how Mubadala started to develop different sectors and grow. It's a wonderful way to describe it. And people know, of course, the great outcome with the Cleveland Clinic and Health Point and all these incredible facilities we could only dream of 13 years ago. It's really significant. Aerospace, these others you've mentioned. So it sounds almost like a wonderful, well, doesn't want to call it a playground, but there's a sense of that creativity could be deployed in all these still underdeveloped sectors, um, education uh, and others. So as a research university, we are, of course, really committed to developing new knowledge. And um, Mubala also really values R&D, research and development, as you build out the tech ecosystem here. Can you tell us something about your hopes for the future of R&D uh, in the UAE? Where do you see it going? And how do you think you and your role can contribute to this? Sure, definitely. Uh, for me, within you know, working within uh, the technology and venture space as well, um, I, I worked with Mubadala on it, and we developed Hub 71, which is a tech ecosystem for the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. But we also work with all the different partners holistically. And before, maybe people were working in silos, but now we started working together, and we realized if we want Abu Dhabi to become a tech hub and become a tech capital, we need to get all the different players talking together and working together. So there has been a lot of change and shift in, reg in the regulatory environment. There has been a lot of push uh, and different subsidies and incentive programs brought forward by the government to start to attract technology into Abu Dhabi. And one main factor, a factor of technology, as you know, is research and development. So there are a lot of different subsidies and incentives just purely for R&D. Um, and, you know, uh, the focus is, especially for our youth, to not only be tech consumers, but also to be tech producers and exporters. And that is the direction that we're taking. And of course, we have to see what is our forte or what are our strong points. And we know that fintech is very important for the region. So fintech is an area we're looking at. Uh, food security and agrotech is very important. And as we know, through this pandemic, health tech uh, is, is quite a prominent area. So we are looking at areas as well that we can excel um, and, and focus on. Uh, very great uh, high level overviews of this. We will come back to this in a little bit, I think. But let's, since it's also extremely important to you, let's look at your role on the Federal National Council. Federal, the country is 50 years old later this year and the Federal National Council celebrated its 49th birthday this month. Uh, clearly, the systems were set up quickly after the founding of the country. Congratulations, Mabruk. Can you help our students understand uh, the Federal National Council's role in shaping the policies of the UAE government and how, how, it, how the body is constituted? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Federal National Council or the UAE parliament uh, is consisted of 40 members. We have one speaker, and then we have uh, 39 members from the from the seven different emirates. Uh, half of the uh, half of the federal national council was uh, elected through an electoral college, and half has been appointed by the government. And 50% are women, and 50% are men. Now, what do we do? What do we do as UAE parliamentarians? Because I, I might get a question, and I, I did get this question quite a lot, but your country is not a democracy. How can you, you know, why do you have parliament or what do you guys do? So we are not a true democracy, but we're also not a true authoritarian regime. We are a hybrid solution. We're a hybrid leadership model. And what the Federal National Council's role within this hybrid model is to pass, amend or reject all the laws 
and and bills, including financial bills that come to to that go to uh, the uh, to ministers basically. So anything that any new law or any amended law or anything, we have the right to review it, to amend it, to pass it, or to reject it. Uh, we also have full, uh, you know, we have full power to uh, examine uh, the annual budgets, as well as review all the financial accounts and final accounts for the country. Um, we are involved in any international treaties or agreements that are made by the government, and we also have representation internationally. Uh, and we also have the ability and right to question uh, ministers. Uh, and we have uh, the ability and right also to bring up topics pertaining to affairs of the of the federation, um, you know, within within the parliament, and we can pass on these recommendations to our leadership uh, as well. So this is the, the 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 authority that we have and the role that we play uh, within government. Thank you for explaining that range. Um, we're aware that the FNC is founded on a culture of Shura, so important to the history of the people of the Arab Peninsula. Can you help us understand what Shura means and what it means in the context of a modern and contemporary um, parliament? Yes, sure. So uh, Shura, uh, it, it comes it comes from a verse in the Quran. So in Surah uh, Shura, the verse is verse number 37, in the Quran, and part of that verse says, وَأَمْرَهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ And the translation of that is, uh, their affairs are to be discussed between them. That is like the, the, the translation of it. And what it means is that anything, any important topic where you don't have a right or wrong answer needs to be discussed amongst the the smartest most intelligent most academic whatever you know scholars and people of of the country and that is why it is built on sh shura um if uh, in abu dhabi if you've been to uh qasr al hassan uh when you see the old the old house you're gonna see just before the old house of where sheikh zaid used to live as a as a child you're gonna see a small uh room just before yeah. it on the right hand side that was actually parliament before so this was actually parliament where the heads of all the Bedouin families used to meet there. And if you go in there, it's still, by the way, they kept it intact. If you go in there, you're going to see that ayat the, from the Quran, وَأَمْرَهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ And if you come to parliament today, uh, the Federal National Council is on the Corniche. The main hall where, where parliament takes place is called Zayed Hall. You will see it above the speaker's head, وَأَمْرَهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ Which means you always discuss the important topics between you and come up with a, you know, with a, with a decision. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. I, I have seen those spaces, but I have not realized that. That's very interesting and, and a beautiful sort of affirmation of the continuance of Bedouin governance principles uh, grounded in Quran. Very, very interesting. But so, uh, Maria, not only in the Quran, you have to look at the history of our country. If yeah. you look at Sheikh Zayed, or let's say in Dubai, Sheikh Rashid, Allah uh, yeah. Sheikh Rashid used to have um, a majlis in the souk where people could come to him to discuss different topics, to negotiate, to question, to do whatever they needed to do. So we've always had that discipline. Uh, it is within our, our culture uh, here in this part of the region. It is based on our religion as well. And it has been the way that we've developed our laws and regulations here. And I think that's very important that we always take into consideration other people's thoughts before making a final decision. Yeah, it's very interesting indeed. And you've explained this to me a little bit before this interesting pathway. You spoke about it. It's, it's a different path from a Western democracy or an Asian uh, society like China. It's different. and. Um, at the time, you explained to me a little bit that uh, in areas like the fantastic management of the pandemic, which has been really good, it, would it be fair to say that in times like that, in fact, the FNC gets out of the way a little bit and says, come on, let's, can you talk a little bit about how the FNC would look at um, or, or be involved or not at all involved, actually, in yeah, sure. the direct management of the pandemic challenges that just came 
so rapidly upon us all. I can tell you about our experience. So us as, yes. as parliamentarians now, when the pandemic happened, we had the right and we, we invited His Excellency, the Minister of, of Health and, and the Prevention, and we questioned him. We asked him about the measures and what, you know, what are the things that, that, are, uh, that are being done and what are the different provisions and restrictions that are being put in place. And we were able to put forward our recommendations. So we did have the ability to, uh, you know, to question and, uh, and ask and, 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 uh, and see what was happening. But we were, also, we, we were also given the chance to put forward our recommendations from what we have heard from, from people. Uh, and we had full faith in our leadership in driving the way forward. Because yes, we did put, uh, you know, the restrictions that were put in place were quite intense and drastic compared to other places. But now we see that what, what the country did was actually to our benefit. And a lot of different foreigners that, that live here say that the UAE was the safest place to be during the pandemic. Alhamdulillah, we, we had uh, you know, uh, you know, very good results. We were able to contain the pandemic as much as we could and control it. But some things are out of our control, you know, and that is true to everywhere globally. But if you look at us as a country, the disciplines that we instilled, the vaccination program, and we're the number two global, um, we're, we're number two globally in terms of vaccine, uh, vaccines. Uh, we really have been at the forefront. And uh, I think the UAE is gonna be an amazing case study uh, that a lot of other countries and a lot of universities as well that are gonna use in the future. We are, as a university, thrilled to be here. Um, and as you can see, I got vaccinated and so have more than 50% of our campus and we'll keep going. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you for uh, sharing that insight. Um, many of our students are interested in public service, international service, NGO service, public service, but they're also very interested in working in other forms of enterprise at the same time, the way you do. Can you? To help us um, see how you balance your your different responsibilities. These are big portfolios, both. How do you manage to do them both? Um, so I think it's a combination. The first thing is you have to be realistic about what you can and what you cannot do. Mm -hmm. Don't overpromise and underachieve. That's very important. I've seen a lot of people who say yes to everything and then they end up, you know, not doing half of what they promised. Be realistic. Don't overpromise and underachieve. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think, is you have to be very organized. Um, have a clear calendar to keep track. Uh, what I do is I merge my calendars. So I merge my Mubadala calendar, my Federal National Council calendar, and my personal calendar, which includes everything with my husband, my kids, uh, you know, anything, even if I want to schedule a coffee with my friends, uh, <laughs> that's all in my calendar. So being organized really helps, uh, you know, uh, put my week and day and everything into perspective and I can, I can manage much better. Um, and I think you need to have the right support. Uh, you know, if you're living with your, you know, if you have a spouse or your parents or whoever you're living with, you have to have the right support uh, mechanism put in place. Even if you're living alone, uh, make sure that uh, you do what you need to do. So uh, if you need to, I don't know, send out your laundry instead of doing it on your own or, you know, whatever you need to do, in order to be realistic and be organized and get things done, then do it. Um, I think that's that's advice I can give. Sometimes it will get out of control, you know. Sometimes you cannot you cannot help it. Like I had a meeting um, that was supposed to end at at four forty five, but then got shifted, and I had to excuse myself to join you. Uh, you know, sometimes you will get a little bit of overlap, but it's going to be manageable. And try to do something that relieves your stress. So. No matter what, don't forget yourself. Try to do something for yourself that makes you feel better. Um, the one hobby I picked up recently, it's been a couple, it's been maybe like eight, nine months now, uh, is boxing. Boxing in my time. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, So do something to keep you, to keep you motivated, to keep, keep you going. It helps you, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, blow off some steam. Um, that's, that's advice that I can give. It's wonderful advice, physical activity, something to distract you, but also something you, your work is so intellectual and so much about talking and being in meetings that indeed getting up and forcing yourself almost to enjoy something else is, I think it's great advice and realistic expectations. I really like that. 
I wanted to make sure that no one who's in this program misses the fact that the parliament is 50% men, 50% women. I, again, I can't think of many countries, including yeah. countries very dear to me, very progressive countries, the Netherlands, the United States, where, where this is not the case. So I, I wanted to, this was obviously uh, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al uh ensured that this would be the case. It was really a mandate. Um, do you have a sense if whether that has, uh, how is it shaped the FNC today? Was it a big change? Um, what, what, what has this done, you think? If, if any, it may be nothing, but um, I'm curious. Um, well, you know, gender diversity within the FNC hasn't been something that was completely new because our previous speaker was a female. Uh, and it's, it's, it's rare that you find, you know, female speakers. So that was already a great achievement on its own. But I think instilling this discipline into 50% of the FNC uh, is something that is so crucial that every single in parliament that we speak to, that's the first thing they comment on. Wow, how did you reach 50%? Right. Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, we had the de delegations from a European uh, parliament that visited us uh, just this week, actually. And they were like, oh, we were extremely, you know, advanced and developed, and we only reached thirty-four percent. So, it's amazing. It's amazing what you guys did. And it, honestly, it is our leadership's uh, view. It is their their vision. If it wasn't for His Highness Sheikh Khalifa instilling this, uh, you know, discipline and putting this Amiri decree in place, and we we might have not reached fifty percent. So, I really do believe that the Parliament and and the leadership have to work hand in hand. We are one body. It's one machine that needs to work together. Now, having more women in parliament means more diverse views, because even with, within the 50%, within the 20 women, we are so diverse. Mm -hmm. We have women that are, let's say, older, um, in uh, working, let's say, in, in chambers of commerce or working with you know, people with special needs. So we have such a diverse group, such diverse backgrounds. Uh, and that is what adds to the mix. And that is what allows us to bring topics up that uh, impact or affect the entire population. We are such a diverse group that we can look at all the different aspects. Like I can speak to the issues that are affecting my generation or that are affecting you know, uh, people that are like 35 and, and below. Uh, but then you have somebody that can, can speak to issues that, um, that relate to you know, retired employees. And, and so we have that diversity and mix that allows us to bring topics that, that really uh, impact the Federation. That's a wonderful perspective, thank you. Um, let's see, I think I'm gonna turn to a couple of questions and then we'll go back to um, the whole question of venture capital and the startup economy. But some questions have already come through that I think is interesting. Uh, this, this relates mostly to uh, Mubadala. This is Rami asking, what is your advice uh, in negotiating with companies when it comes to acquisitions? Uh, that's one question. And here's a, a second, but of course, related question that comes up in acquisitions. How do you manage employee redundancies? Very hard topic. Yeah, it's a very hard topic. People uh, policies and people management, I think, for me, is the most important thing because my team is what makes me. So, you know, my team is my priority. It is very, it's a very, very, very difficult uh, topic. Now, negotiate, negotiating with companies when it comes to acquisitions, well, I did work with mergers and acquisitions for some time. Um, and there, there were, uh, I, was, I was part of the team that also worked on the, uh, there was a uh, merger in Abu Dhabi, a, a real estate development merger that happened uh, quite some time, um, a few years ago. Uh, and I was part of the of the of the project management office of that. Um, it's it's quite tricky because um, you know you have to negotiate what's best for the sustainable outlook of the company, and you cannot just dwell on the past. Uh, so negotiating with companies for you know for mergers or acquisitions is is very is is very difficult because you're trying to see okay. Maybe um, the company has like five lines of business and they're doing very good, but maybe for, for it to be acquired, you need to just focus on three lines of business that are actually going to give you more revenue. 
So you need to look at the sustainable outlook of the company uh, while doing that. And then managing redundancies is, is quite a difficult problem, but at least within Mubadala, within you know the experience that I had, anything related to people is managed very well. We make sure that they're compensated and, and taken care of in a way where it's amicable. Uh, and I think that's, mo that's the most important thing. You cannot control everything. There are instances where there will be uh, redundancies, even if you don't want to, but doing it in an am uh, amicable way um, and giving the person the best chance at getting or pursuing a career uh, uh, in other places is, is the right way to do it. I hear again that emphasis on human dignity uh, that goes back to your story about the security guard at uh, uh, American University of Dubai. Here's another question that relates, I think, especially to your Mubadla role, and that brings us back to the venture capital and startup economy world. Uh, this is a question from Omar. Um, he asks, what do you think are the mega trends in Q1 of 2021 from the perspective of Mubadla? Um, so broad brush, what are you looking at and interested in right now? Okay, um, so what are the key trends I would say within technology? Um, so what we look at in Mubadala is we look at disruption in the sectors that make sense to us. However, um, it, it, it really depends because something might be important to one company that's not so important to us, but for us within Mubadala, um, we are looking at artificial intelligence, we are looking at SaaS, um, we are looking at life sciences, um, we are, um, you know, looking at uh, fintech. Fintech is obviously a very important, uh, you know, uh, contributor to the UAE and to the to the region as a whole. Um, I would say these are the the key areas that we are we are looking at. Um, I see this question also is asking about telemedicine. Telemedicine is yes important. Um, we're not, I would say we're looking less at like medical devices and more at like, um, you know, more wider, uh, you know, life sciences. Um, I'm just trying to read the question. Yes, a lot. He, he's interested in alternative yeah. Uh, yeah. digital telemedicine that includes digital cognitive yeah. behavioral yeah. therapy. These are a wide range of things yeah, that are quite, quite diverse. Yeah. So yes, we are, and Mubadala, yes, we are sector agnostic, especially when it comes to investing within the venture space and within the technology space, but there are certain things that we do not do as well. So we don't really look at consumers. Um, so there are certain things that we don't really do, but if he would like to take the conversation offline, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, I'm, I'm that's a wonderful offer that I'm sure will be happily taken up because trend spotting of course is of course so difficult. And yeah. as you said earlier, you have to make choices and be just as you have to be realistic about your calendar and how much you can handle. And 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 you said it beautifully, I think, not not over promise and under deliver that in, inevitably, even for a capacious uh, company like Mobile or suite of companies, you have to make choices. Let's talk a little bit further about the, um, the venture capital landscape. What do you think are some of the factors that make a city or a country an effective environment for startups? What do you need? Uh, regulation. For me, I think the regulatory environment is very, very important. Um, I, cannot, I cannot be a tech capital and promise, uh, you know, companies to come and we're going to be the next Silicon Valley if I don't have the regulatory uh, environment in place. So working with the regulators is very, very, very important. Um, I think also um, making it livable, right? You can, you can promote all different places and all, you know, and do everything that you can, but if it's not livable, uh, then you're not going to get people and it has to be affordable as well, right? So I can give you the example with Hub71. What we did is we've, um, uh, Oyo is one of uh, a company that we've indirectly invested in, uh, has come set up some, some um, spaces in Abu Dhabi for people to rent out and so on that is affordable. Um, we've created, um, uh, you know, licensing at a very reasonable rate, um, free office space, if you, if you of course meet the, the requirements and so on. 
to make it uh, to make it affordable uh, health insurance and so on. So there's a lot of different aspects that go into what is being offered by Abu Dhabi. And of, of course, Abu Dhabi is a great place to live. People want to come and live here. It, it, it's, it's a very nice environment. So I think it's, it's just like everything bundled up together um, is important. But for me, of course, the number one thing is the regulatory environment because you cannot have a startup come and let's say if it's let's say it's an autonomous driving company. How are they going to do testing if the, the regulatory environment is not in place? So for especially for you know test beds and um, and sandboxes, the regulatory environment needs to be um, allowing uh, for startups to work and 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 grow. And this is the aim, right? We want Abu Dhabi to be uh, a tech hub where we have where we graduate tech giants. We want the next unicorn, you know, Mina unicorn, to come out of Abu Dhabi. So um, definitely, we are working hand in hand with all the different players to facilitate that ecosystem. I'd like the next unicorn to come out of NYU Abu Dhabi and start AD in collaboration okay. with Mubala. That would be amazing. But what you've said makes a lot of sense to me. So regulation, interestingly, is often seen as an impediment to business. It all depends on how you position it. But I'm hearing you say that so, so regulation can be both um, you want to be safe in, with your investments and what you're doing, but you also need structures that facilitate and make it attractive. And that's regulation too, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, one thing I want to say for our students and some alums may be with us as well, one of the founding reasons for Emre Abu Dhabi coming to Abu Dhabi for being created by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed and NYU together in partnership is um, the fact that universities add great zest to capitals, great zest to cities and countries with the intellectual offer they bring, the talents, but also just the pleasure of theater and art and sports and a beautiful campus, as you see behind me, that people can go to when it's not coronavirus. I think there's a real connection between that vision for higher education and universities here and the development of this favorable climate that you describe. Yeah, um, and we'll keep doing that. So uh, quite a few of our students uh, consider starting their own ventures. Quite a few have. In fact, uh, I had a wonderful panel with four uh, social and business entrepreneurs out of Abu Dhabi uh, yesterday. And it was great to see they were here. They were in Moscow. They were in Stockholm. They were in all these different enterprises. Um, but of course, we talked a little bit about financing and support. So you, as a value creator, uh, what are the sorts of criteria you, you look for to decide what makes a startup worthy of an investment? They all sound kind of good, right? So how do you know what to pick? Well, it has to be a novel idea that brings disruption, right? That is, is very important. But for me, and I think I highlighted this, is the management team. Uh, <laughs> In, at, at, in the beginning, you know, especially at the early stages, people are not gonna invest in you because of your idea. They're gonna invest in you because of you as a person. And usually your, your first investors are friends and family, right? So they don't invest in the idea, they invest in you. Uh, so the management team is, is very important. And you have to have a solid idea and you have to have a sustainable trajectory. You have to have a sustainable growth plan. So let's say you just started, you have a new idea, you want to start building it, and you have $100,000. How do you make that $100,000 sustainable for your first 12 or 18 months, right? How do you bootstrap? Uh, when is your next fundraise? How do you think outside the box? How do you identify your weaknesses? If you're very good in developing the idea, but you know that you know, you know nothing about finance, right? Try to find a partner that can help you or try to get into a, an incubating program or an accelerator where you can get that support uh, for free basically. Um, but you know, how do you identify your first client? How do you target your first client? So once you develop the idea, don't only think of it as an idea, but think about who are the right partners to bring in with you on that journey and how should you develop your product to make it marketable? I think that is very important because you can have an amazing idea, but if it's worth nothing and you can't sell it, then what's the point, right? Very true. This relates to a question uh, from the community here from Antenne. 
And Antenne asks, um, the first question he asks is, how do the panelists, but especially you, the panelists, I would say, how do you see the role of entrepreneurship as a means to develop 21st century skills and competencies? And how then do we, and this is a good question for me, instill the mindset of innovative thinking among university students in addition, you know, as a means of creating a business? Of course, the person is important, but so there have to be some ideas. So how, how, what are the right, how, what can universities do here, you think? Okay, so in the UAE before, people used to graduate to work in the government or to work in, you know, a different, uh, you know, prominent or very good names like Mubadala. But we have to be realistic. How many employees can Mubadala actually retain? How many employees can the government retain? There is going to come a point where you can't. And what is the sole driver of an economy? The private sector. We know that. We know that, and it's instilled in our in all our different you know economic books. The public sector drives the economy. So if you're a university student and you have an idea and you want to go ahead and do it, you have nothing to lose. Why not go ahead, start it? Even start it in Start AD. Start AD is an excellent program. If you have an idea and you're able to develop it, then why not start? You're, you're not going to lose anything. If you do well, you do well. If you, if you don't do well, you're 21 years old or you're 20 years old or 22 or whatever. You have, you have a lifetime ahead of you. So I think you have to uh, be comfortable with taking that risk and taking that venture. You cannot be an entrepreneur if you're not comfortable with the risk. If you're comfortable with the risk, then go ahead and, 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 and start. And keep in mind that the government cannot hire everyone uh you know big companies cannot hire everyone the private sector needs to develop and it needs to take over the economy so why not be part of that change why not be you know uh bring your novel idea and you never know how it's going to develop even if it goes to a certain level and then uh, 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 one of the large you know uh, SaaS companies buys it from you why not um then you start off with your next venture i think it's just um uh, it's a leap of faith that you have to take um that's what we heard very much from these entrepreneurs yesterday and from Badr Jafar a few weeks ago, who talked all about his a, a number of small serial failures early in his career, and he got stronger from it and bounced back. Um, very good advice. Hayat here wants to broaden out the question a little bit for the UAE um, and, and asks, um, since Mubala is one of the organizations here that has been deeply invested not only in diversifying the economy, but also in developing our nation's talent, knowledge and expertise. What do you think are the skills and expertise that is most important for Emirati citizens to develop over the next few decades? Um, and how is Mubarla planning to continue to contribute to that development of the, I hear this as, as quite uh, the locally grounded talent yeah. development. Um, so the way I would answer that is we need to see the direction of the world, right? Where is the world going? What is becoming more prominent and more important? Um, before, and if you look at the UAE, let's say in the 70s, and you can all ask your fathers, what were they in? What, what did they work in? They were either bankers or they were working in Adnoc or oil and gas. Everyone was either in banking or oil and gas. That's it. But now we have so many different avenues. One example is Mubadala's investment in, um, in aerospace, right? We're, we're building out this Nebraska Aerospace Park in Al Ain because the, uh, we needed a place to, to, to work on aerospace, given that we're in such a unique location. We're uh, a four hour flight, I think, from a third of the world. Uh, so we, can, we have such good connectivity. We're, we're so like centrally located. Um, and we have an underutilized airport in Al Ain. Um, and we have the ability to build uh, aerostructures here. And we have the ability to attract Airbus, Boeing, Rolls Royce, whoever it is to come and set up here. So um, we started building out this park, right? And so 10 or 15 years ago, if you told me, if I was, a, if I was just graduating from high school and you told me, oh, go study something within like uh, aeromechanical engineering, I would have been like, no, not really. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, we have a whole sector that's being developed in that area. We have a whole sector that's being developed for aluminum. We have a whole sector that's being developed in healthcare. 
So you can see, you can go on Mubadala's website and see what are the sectors that are being developed. And then if you want to study or pursue a career or education in that field, I guarantee you, you know, nine times out of 10, we have universities now in the UAE that have courses that allow you to grow um, in these areas. We have very good universities for healthcare. We have, uh, you know, Khalifa University and the whole uh, University for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, we have NYU. We have, we have so many good institutions that have so, such diverse programs that will allow you to grow and develop within these sectors. And that's not only true to, to Mubadala, but you can see, you can look at the, the, the vision uh, for the next 50 years, right? The, UAE, the, the next 50 years and the, the vision of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Zayed uh, in terms of um, diversifying, diversifying away from oil dependency. So he's highlighted all the things that we are focusing on. So if you start reading into the different uh, policies and programs that are put in, uh, put in place, you'll start to realize, okay, we are investing in all these different places. That means I can pursue a career here or here or here. Um, and like I said, most recently, the space program, who knew that we could be able to, to have a career in space? But now we can. Um, so it's always important to have this open mindset and, and look at what are the sectors being developed. Uh, and start to look at programs and and uh, and uh, schools that help you to to fill a gap. I think that's very important for you to discipline yourself as well. What a wonderful answer! And I would agree. One of the things that has been so impressive to me, first having come here and started to pay close attention in two thousand seven, is that the country sets stretch goals that people can imagine themselves into in the way that you've described. So the space program, which was just a kind of glimmer in someone's eye 10 years ago, in six years time, um, obviously Her Excellency Sarah Al-Amiri built a team. As you've said, it was a very diverse team. She talks about the value of diversity and the science part of the team, they're science and technical and logistics, but the science part of the team was 80% women. Yes. That makes change when people see themselves in these roles and possibilities. The same for other areas, energy, renewables, uh, really thinking, being very thoughtful about what a country needs, especially when you know that at some point in the future, won't be now, it isn't immediate, but at some point in the future, that oil uh, resource will be depleted. This is inevitable. So it's, 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 I think that's where you see the work of companies like Mubadala coming up behind uh, to steer forward uh, into these goals that are set at a quite high level, actually. It's very, very interesting to observe. One, one, well, here, uh, one area, if you're looking yeah. at, at public service as well, is you had the minister that came out of NYU, right? You had the minister that came out of NYU. Shama. Yeah, and Shama was 22 years old when she got her first role and a big responsibility. So if she can, you can too. You know, she, she has shown you, she's, she's guiding the way. She's, she's shown that if you want to pursue a career, then go for it. Be ambitious about it and you will get it. I think we've seen that quite a bit in the country. Antenne had another uh, good question that connects with uh, this and it's a bit more specific. Are there uh, plans by the FNC or a mobile investment company or other entities you're aware of to encourage and support university students to pursue entrepreneurship during their university years and to help them get going. For example, sort of a one, two year startup visa program uh, for students with a startup portfolio. It may be a, the visa program may, may be metaphorical rather than, than specifically related to immigration, but are there some of these pipeline encouragement programs specifically to encourage entrepreneurs that get into the kind of startup activity that you, that you look for? Um. So I know within, within NYU, you can do it on Start AD, right? Mm, uh, yes. Uh, and Start AD is, a, is an excellent program. I actually worked with them uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's an excellent program for students to come. And actually, that, um, because Start AD is the, the eye of, of NYU, we look at Start AD and start looking within Start AD as, at what's interesting, right? It's still very early for us as Mubadala. But we already have, it's, it's gonna be in the pipeline. So we start to, to look at ways that we can support. 
Um, there are a couple of different accelerator programs that are actually located in Hub 71. Uh, and we provide like free mentorship uh, to some of their, their startups, even though even if they are very, very early days. Um, are there any specific plans? Um, not per se. However, uh, the, the last ministry, ministerial cabinet, cabinet shift uh, uh, introduced three new ministers of economy, one of uh, which is focused on SMEs. And we did, we did have a new ministry that was put up or that is focused on, on manufacturing and technology as well. So I do believe that um, it's in the pipeline, but I haven't seen anything per se uh, done. It's done mainly through the different universities. And if you participate in an incubator challenge or, or so on, but nothing per se, but there are so many different opportunities. I think you're right that the new Minister of State for uh, SMEs uh, is, is and, and entrepreneurship has many ideas and indeed is reaching out to universities, which is really wonderful. So watch this space, as they say. Uh, wonderful question. Here, a few more uh, questions. Um, you've talked a lot about Hub 71. I wanted to ask you a little bit more. What are sort of values that drive that project? And um, so, so as I understand it, you have to be a little bit along in the development of your company before you can really go go sit there and take up uh, rent office space and so forth and fill yourself of the opportunities. But where did Hub 71 come from? I, I really am curious about it. So Hub 71 uh, was an idea that was that was been in, I think, a lot of people in Mubadala's minds for quite some time. We wanted to develop an ecosystem where technology can come and go. And, and what does that mean? You have a lot of different programs, but there was always something missing, right? Either you didn't have university students or, or you didn't have mentors or you didn't have companies that were willing to buy your product or you didn't have accelerators or there's always one player within the ecosystem that was missing. So we really aspire to bring together this ecosystem where everyone can meet and interact in one place and then ideas will grow. Um, and that's, that was the main purpose behind it. And uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan is also the, the, the chairman of the board of Mubadala. Uh, he had a state visit to, to France uh, a couple of years back and he visited Station F. Station F is, um, it's basically a rundown train station that they took and they developed to, be, to house technology. And he loved the idea and he said, you know what, we can have something. This was the inspiration behind it. We can create something like this in Abu Dhabi because we have the ability as Abu Dhabi to be uh, a tech capital for the MENA region. We can, so why not? And that's where the inspiration came from. And we started to look at it. How can we uh, build a model or an ecosystem that makes sense for Abu Dhabi, that makes sense for MENA, but at the same time attracts technology from abroad into, into, um, into Hub 71. Uh, and that's how we went about it. We wanted to make sure it's a one-stop shop for everything you need. But to be fair, you need to be at a certain level, right? Um, in order to develop these startups. So we wanted to make sure that we were attracting like um, a, you know, a certain um, size. However, um, Start AD, uh, if I'm not mistaken, has space in Hub 71. And there are different university programs that have space in Hub 71 because if your students are coming to, to the Start AD space in, in Hub 71 uh, and they meet a founder and the founder is looking for someone that's focused on engineering, let's say, and you have a, a NYU student that is, that is gonna be graduating from their engineering program very soon, then they found their new employee. So there's also these linkages and networks that can be created. Um, so I, I would say, you know, take advantage of the programs you have in your school and you have the ability to get on, but at the same time, go check out the space. You're not losing anything. You can still meet people. Uh, a lot of the founders are looking for, for younger, um, you know, students to, to help them maybe as interns as well. Uh, so why not just go and visit and, and take a look. Wonderful advice. And in fact, it relates to several questions we have here that look at it, things from the other side a little bit. For example, 
to have a startup uh, environment the way you've described it, you also need quite a few people who are really equipped to work in tech, to code, to do other sorts of things, right? So outside, this is Jun Bin Ho asking, outside of becoming founders ourselves, what are other ways for students to get involved with the tech and venture capital community in Abu Dhabi? Um, if you don't want to become a founder, um, but you want to be involved, you can, for example, be part of an accelerator program or an incubator program as a part of the team, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want to be a founder, um, you can um, work, if you work in a corporate company uh, and that corporate is looking for disruptive innovation to their, to their sector, you can hook them up with, you know, with companies in Hub71 that could maybe answer their questions. Um, I, there are so many, you know, you have to look at all the different ecosystem players and see where you fit in. The banks, for example, the banks play a big role because startups still need financing. They still need bank accounts. Um, they still need insurance. Uh, so everyone is involved. You just have to see what you like to do uh, and try to pursue it. Uh, he's right. Maybe, maybe you don't want to become a founder, but you want to be involved in technology. Um, you know, what can you do about that? Maybe you can be part of a tech company right um so it, it, it's really you know up to you to see how you want to get involved it depends on what your area of interest is there are many ways to engage without even being a coder or a financier here's an interesting question though for an ambitious person who might not this is maya asking a question um of course there are initiatives to support student entrepreneurs and these other ways of getting into it. What about inspiring investors? Um, if as a student, you can imagine yourself in that investment arena, how can you enter that field? It can be intimidating for people. Very, what need, very, where might you go to school or what should you learn? I think it is, um, you learn through experience, right? The first dollar you raise, is going to be probably the closest to your heart. Uh, but how do you go about it? Uh, and like I said, when you first start, like especially if we look at Silicon Valley companies, they start in their, like in their garages, right? Um, when you first start and you're working out of a garage, the first buck you're going to raise is probably from your friends and family. So how do you, but once you do that and once you start to articulate the story, you start to fine tune it. And slowly, slowly, as you grow, you need to put, um, the proper financial disciplines in place. You need to have the right accounting methods and so on. Uh, but a lot of people will help you along the way. So let's say, for example, I know a lot, a lot of banks that provide like these um, SME loans and um, you know different things. They also do provide training uh, how to you know how to manage your accounts. How to, so if you're not a finance professional or or studied finance, uh, you 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 will still get some sort of training. Let's say from from the bank when opening an account and so on. Uh, Khalifa Fund. Khalifa Fund is an excellent program. If you want to start raising your first couple of you know, thousands or, or whatever you need to get going, it is an excellent program to, to, uh, to, uh, to submit uh, to. And part of Khalifa Fund is not only providing you with financial capital, but they do also provide um, uh, training courses on how to set up your business because they do understand that entrepreneurs and first-time business owners are very focused on their product but they might uh, lose focus when it comes to the different important aspects like marketing, like finance and so on. And so they help them to, to build a more well-rounded individual versus just focusing on that one specific uh, product. That's very helpful indeed. NYU Abu Dhabi also has graduate students. It's a growing community for us. So I really like this question from Jad. Um, Jad asks, um, who I think is a graduate student. What is Mubadla's vision on involving academic researchers, academic researchers in producing the next generation of tech startups and break through commercializable scientific research? That oh. space of translation, what's Mubadla's vision for those possibilities? So what I can tell you there is that we are not developing tech on our own. So we are tech investors, right? we deploy capital uh, into tech. Um, so we do not, I, I cannot say um, that we will be personally involving academic researchers. However, we do have an excellent, 
excellent uh, person that's part of our uh, US team, uh, who's also you know, somewhat part of Abu Dhabi government, that produces research. Uh, he's uh, Dr. Rafiq, he's excellent. And he produces our annual, annual tech letter. His tech letter is inspiring to founders. It's amazing. So we do have research that we do. However, um, we are still, Mubadil is, is a, it's important to, to know that the, the difference. Mubadil is a tech investor, right? Um, but uh, I'm sure that the Ministry of AI, uh, the Ministry of Manufacturing and Technology, the different universities, institutions will, will play a significant role here. Mm -hmm. It's true, and they often come to our conferences, those very ministries, the ministers themselves sometimes do, infrastructure, all these, these different areas. Um, does Mubadala, this is Rami asking, does Mubadala hold shares in the e-commerce industry, an emerging and growing market in the UAE, and, but, and more broadly, what do you think about foreign companies like Amazon dominating uh, the e UAE e-commerce market? dominates most e-commerce markets as far as I can see, but um, there are some alternatives to it. We know that in the country, uh, for example, but uh, how uh, is this a, 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 an industry worth getting into for um, a company like Mobarla? I mean, um, I, I cannot disclose what we've uh, invested in. Uh, however, we do uh, we do invest in a wide range, and if if he's, if uh, Rami, if you mean um, within the venture space with so smaller companies, we are looking at a couple of other players that are involved in e-commerce, but not e-commerce companies per se. Uh, and in, in terms of the shares that we hold, I, I'm, it's not my place to disclose. Uh, of course, what we have, but uh, but um, uh, you know. E-commerce is a huge market and with the pandemic has become even larger and we see the importance of it. Um, and, and there are a lot of studies that talk about, you know, the, uh, the closing down of malls and a lot of, you know, for example, Zara. Zara is closing down so many stores yeah. to go online instead. So you do see that transition. So I do believe there is quite significant growth and, and uh, you know, within that space. And, uh, like my, my three-year-old daughter today, if I tell her, like if she says, oh, mama, I want to buy something, she's not going to say, let's go to the store to say, can you order it online? This is like, this is the future. This is what the future generations actually refer to. So there is significant growth uh, about Amazon dominating. I think there's, you know, you always have someone dominating the market, but as we've seen over the years, everything shifts. So we don't know if it will continue dominating the market in the next five, 10, 15 years, or if other players are gonna emerge, but it'll be interesting to, to watch the space. Thank you for that. I have three more questions and then we'll let you get on with your evening. You've been so generous with your time, but I am interested in this question from uh, someone in the field here. Could you talk a little bit more about your experience with change management? Mm -hmm. So important to all of us right now. Very important, very, very important. And I think um, change management is, is extremely important from, a, from an institutional perspective, from a personal perspective, uh, everything. So uh, I, will, I will give you um, an example about Mubadala. So Mubadala merged with IPIC a few years back. And so we went from being only Mubadala to changing and becoming this literally double the size of an institution, new sectors, new people. We went from being in one building to being in four or five different buildings around Abu Dhabi. So that was a huge change and impact on our organization. But mm. the change was managed very well. Uh, the way that it was done is that the institution started to, uh, to, to um, reach out to employees uh, and get feedback on what is important and what we need to do to make sure that we keep that uh, feeling of, of being one family in place. Um, you know, so, so that was a very good experience. Uh, for me as well, you know, the transition and change from being an employee to being a manager, uh, you know, where you know, I used to not only report upwards, but now you know, having direct reports, uh, changing and transition in, in everything. There, Change can happen in so many, and, and the biggest change I think for your students will be uh, their transition from university to, to careers and working or creating their own businesses. Um, 
same messages that I, I repeat is you have to be organized, you have to be disciplined, and you have to hold yourself accountable. Um, and understand that change is inevitable uh, and see what, how can you get to the best outcomes that suits you or suits your organization or suits your institution or whatever it is. Um, try to always look at how to get the best outcome that is, that is good for you. This is a lovely question uh, from an anonymous uh, uh, attendee here. And uh, you're a very modest person in my uh, experience. You're quick to praise others. This person is asking your excellency, what is one example of a significant contribution that you have made? This is an invitation really to say something that you're especially proud of, small or large. Uh, I know you don't like to brag about yourself and it's okay. Um, but just a reflection. Yeah, I think, um, maybe I'll share a story instead. It's mm -hmm. not going to answer it, but it's 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 it will help to answer it. Mm -hmm. um, my old manager in two thousand and eight, yeah, two thousand and eight. Um, you know, every year we have to create our objectives. Uh, you know, beginning of the year, middle of the year, and so on. Um, so I created my objectives for the you know, beginning of the year two thousand eight. Put them together, and I tried to be very focused, and you know very detailed and make sure that my objectives are you know reachable and the, the the goals are organized and they're smart goals and i really worked hard on it um but the way i did it was i put down what i want to achieve in the next 10 years but what i can do this year to achieve what i need to do for the next 10 years and so she's no longer my manager she's in, she lives in san francisco now uh, but she, she emailed me a few days ago saying that she had uh, IT archive, uh, auto archive and remove, like um, bring back some of her archive. Uh, and my objective email popped up. <laughs> well, she shared this with me. And she, the, the message that she wrote to me, she said, Mira, look at your objectives in 2008 and look at where you are now. Ever since the beginning, I knew that I want to work in public service. I knew that I want to go in Mubadala. And somehow these small steps that I took in 2008 are, were, were really stepping stones to where I am today. So I really do believe um, the contribution that I made to myself and to my organization is uh, I worked hard and I trained myself and uh, I took I grasped any opportunity that I could find to grow, to become a significant member of the Mubadala leadership group today. Uh, proudly one of three females on the leadership team uh, in Mubadala. Um, and I did not forget what I love, which is serving uh, you know, the public. And, and I made sure that even though I'm focused on my career in Mubadala, I still left time to do what I love. Um, so that is a, I think a significant contribution that I have made um, to myself and to my country and, and to Mubadal. I don't know if someone wants a more concrete yes. answer. About no, it's a beautiful answer. I think it's a very beautiful answer and shows the purposefulness that has guided you uh, all along, even as you're clearly also an extremely adaptable person. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful story for our students. My very last question, it's almost as if you've answered it, but maybe you can give some more directional advice. What would you say to our students uh, today who are heroic in the way they have dealt with this incredibly difficult condition of the pandemic? I am so proud of them all and also feel constantly a little remiss in not being able to offer them the full scope of the education that we want to give and that we know and what we can give. But nonetheless, uh, there are things we can give, and one of the things we can give is encouragement. What would you say uh, to our students today as they contemplate uh, the year or so ahead? Um, first thing, I think going back to the question about change management, I think the biggest change uh, you know, process that we all uh, had to digest was this pandemic. Um, and the one thing that I learned about this pandemic is that the world will go on. You, you know, we weren't able within the FNC to have you know physical 
sessions of parliament under, you know, in Zayed Hall, but we went virtual. Uh, classes went virtual. We adapted. Uh, I had to get used to, you know, my daughter coming into my Zoom meetings that we were just speaking about before the <laughs> call. So we know that we have to, you know, for you to, to grow and develop, you just need to adapt. Sometimes things are going to happen and you're going to be like, oh, why did this happen to me? Or I wish, um, you know, it would have been done differently, but don't, don't bring yourself down about things that are out of your control. If it's out of your control, you cannot do anything about it, then find a way to make yourself happy, to, 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 to grow, to develop. Um, write things down. Uh, I feel whenever I write things down, I sort of find a way to manifest, uh, you know, and, uh, and get things done. So I, I always believe like, if you prefer typing, then type it, but just get a pen and write it down. Honestly, it makes a big difference. Um, make sure to always be committed. Uh, you can start to show yourself that you can be committed, uh, let's say by taking a 15 minutes jog every day. That just shows your ability to commit to something. If you can commit to something for three weeks straight, it becomes a habit. You can commit to it for a long term. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the advice that I have. And NYU AD is such an amazing institution. Uh, the, the caliber of the students that are graduating from NYU AD is like we've never seen before. You are really, you know, graduating top-notch uh, students into the into the into the job market. But you know, whoever wants to get a job, um, make sure you start working on it today. Build your network, uh, you know, and start looking at areas that you want to pursue. If you want, you have if you have an idea, if you have a novel idea and you want to pursue it, go ahead, take the chance. You never know; you might create the next. Uh, Amazon or, or whatever it is. So why not? Um, and just um, know that you are the driving force behind yourself. You should be your number one fan. Uh, you should always pat yourself on the back and say, good job, me. You know? And just keep driving yourself. Don't worry, wait for affirmation from anyone. Do what you need to do to make yourself happy, to build your career. Um, I think at the end of the day, that's what counts, right? You have to go to bed happy and knowing that you did the best you can. Thank you so much. I think it's wonderful and wise advice. Um, Your Excellency, uh, Mira al -Sawedi, thank you so very, very much for being with us and being so frank and helpful and, uh, and inspiring. Uh, this was a great conversation. We'll okay. follow up with you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Stay healthy, stay safe. Bye-bye.